So today I'm welcoming Dr. Nikki Gammons to the Enter Life program. Uh, Do Nikki is the conservation manager for Southeast England for Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And she's overseen a number of projects, all with B puns in the title. Um, and we're going to be hearing today about how a number of them, I, I believe, have contributed to a fantastic reintroduction project for the short haired bumblebee in Southeast England. So, Nikki, over to you. And thank you for talking today. Great, thank you very much and uh, hello to everyone that's uh, joined us to, today. So as said, I'm Nikki, uh, so I'm going to talk to you um, and here's the outline. So first of all, I'll give you just a brief introduction to bumblebees, just to set the scene and give you a little bit of background about why we attempted to do this reintroduction. So I'll talk a little bit about their ecology, their conservation, an introduction to their life cycle and a little bit about the uh, identification of them as well. I'll then talk about our reintroduction. So some of the things that worked, some of the things that didn't work uh, so well as well. And I'll talk about the legacy project that we have of this, which is called Be Connected. I'll also introduce another project that we currently have running, uh, which is in the east end of London, which is called B. Um, I'll then talk to you right at the end about how you can get involved with recording in and around your local area. So let's start off then with our bumblebees. So basically, uh, they are the big, fluffy, furry bees. So we have bound about 278 bee species in the UK. The vast majority of these, over 250, are actually our solitary bees. We then have one species of honeybee, and we did have recorded 27 different types of bumblebees. But some of these, unfortunately, have gone extinct, and many of them are rare and threatened. So how does it work within a bumblebee society where well, you have a queen and then you have the worker cast? Now, the workers are also females as well. The difference between them and a queen is that they do not have fully developed ovaries. So they're not able to mate and produce fertile offspring. So at this time of year, you've probably seen the really big bumblebees emerging. So those are our queen bees and they're about an inch or so big. So they're pre-mated before they come out of hibernation. And what they're doing at the moment is looking for somewhere suitable to find a nest. Once that queen has found that area, she will start to collect nectar and pollen. And then she will feed that pollen. The pollen um, will be fed to the larvae and then they will eventually turn into workers, which takes around about about six weeks. So from egg to fully developed adult worker is about six weeks. So the first six weeks of that colony development it is the queen that's going out and foraging for them. Once the workers are produced, they then go out and replace them. So workers are just mini versions uh, of the queen. They have exactly the same color pattern. So a queen bumblebee can live for a maximum of one year, but if she does live for that long, the majority of her lifespan is actually spent in hibernation. And that would be anything between six to nine months. The life cycle of a bumble nest on average is around about three and a half months, with one species, the common carder, having one about five months. At the end of that colony cycle, the original queen, the workers and the males will die and only the new queens will survive. So bees in the UK, as I said, we have around 278 species um, or so, one of which is the domesticated honeybee, which isn't classed as rare or threatened. So the number of honeybees is directly correlated with the number of honeybee keepers uh, that we have. Whereas our bumblebees and solitary bees are the bees that are actually declining. So if we look at um, our our bees, one in three of our solitary bees and bumblebees are classed as rare or threatened. So this can mean they have a minimum of 60% decrease in their population, some of them even over 90%. So now, of course, of high conservation importance. In the case of our bumbles, over the last 80 or so years, two species have actually gone extinct. And we have a further one that is no longer recorded. So it's only temporarily recorded actually in Kent for one year. And we class that as a failed colonisation as opposed to an establishment and then an extinction. Of our bumbles, a further seven are classed as biodiversity action plan, which again means that they've had a huge range reduction, so of high conservation importance. So, of course, I'll just briefly go over this. We know how important our bees are for pollination, but also moths, butterflies, hoverflies, beetles, wasps will also contribute, of course, towards pollination. So, of course, our bees have a high monetary value. They're important for pollinating many of our most important agricultural crops, but many of our wildflowers as well. 
So bit of the doom and gloom. Why are really many of our bumblebees, our other bee species, our solitary bees, our other insect pollinators declining? Well, over the last 80 or so years, we've actually lost over 97 percent of the ancient wildflower meadows. So, of course, that's had a massive impact on our bees about where they can nest, where they can forage, where they can hibernate as well. So what happened during this time? Well, it was during and after the end of the Second World War. Of course, we had an increase in population which we needed to feed and we'd just come out of rationing as well. So farming had to intensify. But it wasn't done quite so sustainably. So when it intensified, a lot of our common land was put into heavy production. Livestock numbers increased and increased use of pesticides and fertilisers. A lot of hedgerows taken out. So, for example, if you increase the use of fertilisers, so this would be changing from management from a wildflower meadow to a silage meadow, you increase the fertility, you increase and encourage the grasses to grow, and those would dominate and outcompete the wildflowers. Also an increased use of pesticides as well. So from the 1940s, they used to use organophosphates. These were put on the back of boom sprays and sprayed at high, quite high dosages at different times of the day. Since the 1990s, they've been using a group of chemicals called neonicotinoids. And neonics are sprayed before that crop, um, the seed is sown into the ground. But as that crop grows, it's evenly distributed throughout it. So it's still found in the pollen and nectar. So those beneficial insects that are feeding on the pollen and nectar are also ingesting the neonicotinoids. As the name suggests, they are um, based on nicotine and they're a nerve cell effector and it can affect the motor neurons in the brains of the bees so they can become disorientated. And if they become disorientated or lost, it means that less food is delivered back into that colony. And with our bumblebees, the amount of food that comes in can be directly correlated with the number of new queens and new males that are produced. Of course, we've also got increase in urbanisation, which has meant fragmentation of habitat. So even though we might have good habitat that remains in certain places across the UK, there may not be corridors or links to link up these populations and they then might become isolated as well. Something as well, of course, we're noticing is the occurrence of climate change as well. So, of course, this is greatly affecting uh, our bee species uh, as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. But the most important thing really is something we can all do to help. And that's where anybody that's got a garden, if you volunteer at a community space, if you have an allotment, those are some of the best places now, particularly in an urban area where you can find a good diversity of our bees. At Bumblebee Conservation Trust, we have an app called Bee Kind. And on this, you can click on all of the flowers that you've got in your garden, community space, on your allotment and it gives you some idea about what else you can plant as well. So bridging those gaps where you may have not have anything in flower and having a variety of different corolla lengths of those flowers as well. So you can have different tongue lengths of pollinators visit them. We've also got another uh, application on our website, which is called Be The Change. And Be The Change gives you a monthly bee menu about what you can plant um, as well for the bees. If you've got a flat, what you can put in plant plots, um, in your balconies, how to go a bit more pesticide free um, as well. So there's lots of sort of tips and advice on there. Also, what we can do um, in and around our gardens, of course, is create nesting habitat. Now, the majority of our bees cannot bring in their own nesting materials. They have to nest where something else has nested before, such as rodents. So they would go under paving stones, rockery sheds, even in blue tint nest boxes. And they're using that straw, the fur, the feather, um, the hay to keep their insulation nest warm. Compost heaps are also a very good area for them as well. So in our gardens, we can put these things. I know that's a talk that's, that's gonna be coming up um, next for Ento Live, but these are great for our solitary bees. If you have them around about a minimum of 10 inches long, that's ideal and having a variety of diameters between two to eight millimeters, you'll then get a variety of different solitary bees moving in. But if you wanna hear more about that, do join uh, the next Ento Live. Best thing for bumbles is putting up a blue tit nest box. You can put these up south facing, leave the nesting material in if a blue tit has nested there before, or you can add in some grass cuttings, um, some straw, some hay that would then keep that uh, nest warm. If you'd like a blue tit in it, clean it out and uh, leave it north facing. 
So other things you can do in and around your garden as well is create nesting and hibernation sites. So some of our carder bees, and we have five species of carder bee, four of them being rare, will nest on the surface area and they will card grass stems together. So they like longer areas of grass. So leaving some of your, your grass longer is ideal for those species. You can also create litter piles, log piles those are great for hibernation sites also for nesting areas as well and as i said compost heaps are great as well so a little bit more background uh, going into the life cycle because this will sort of as well explain why some of our bees may be more rare as well at this time so during this time um, of year you'll be seeing the really big bumbles uh, coming out and those are queens that are emerging from hibernation and they are hibernating in a north facing bank or slope. So they hibernate north facing because they don't want to get um, the sun too early and warm up before of course the flower species are there. So they will hibernate through the winter but they are pre-mated before they go into hibernation. Once the temperatures are right that queen will emerge but she hasn't taken any food with her during hibernation. So she's relied entirely on her fat reserves. So she needs to find food immediately. So she's got a neck to up. And even with a full honey stomach, a bumblebee can only power 40 minutes of flight. So that's why it's incredibly important to have a continuation of nectar and pollen available for them in our gardens, in our open spaces. This time of year, you might see as well, the bumblebee queens sort of zigzagging over um, areas and they're looking for somewhere suitable to find a nest. Once she finds that nest, she'll build a waxy pot and then she'll regurgitate all of her nectar into that. She will then group all of her pollen together and lay her eggs on top of it. Once they form into larvae, they have mouth parts and they will start to eat that pollen. So for the first six weeks, it is purely the queen that goes out and forages for her colony. As soon as her workers, her first brood of workers are produced, they replace her. So in a bumblebee colony, you have three worker brood cycles, and that would take the colony up to around about three months. And right at the end of the colony cycle is when the new queens and the males are produced. Now, at the end of the colony cycle is when the most amount of food is coming in because you have the most amount of workers. So any female egg can potentially become a queen. It just depends how much food she's actually had during the larval stage. So if she's in an area with good resources, that colony will have more queens produced. If it's in an area where very poor resources are available, less queens will be produced. So it's highly variable within a species, between species, depending on the amount of habitat, good resources that is available. So right at the end of the colony cycle, um, the new queens, as I said, and the males are produced, the males will disperse away from the nest and they won't return. They will remain out and they are looking for queens from another colony to mate with. The next, the virgin queens will emerge from that colony. They will mate with just one male. And then if it's midsummer and an early emerging species, they will skip hibernation and they can fit in a second life cycle. If it's at the end of summer and a late emerging species, those new queens will go into hibernation to then emerge the next year. At the end of the colony cycle, the original queen, the workers and the males will die. So a life cycle on average is around about three, three and a half months, but they need that continuation of forage throughout it. So let's then have a look at our bumblebee species. So these are our most common species. So in any good garden, um, for those of you that are particularly in the south, you will find all of these seven uh, species there. So it's easy to create a habitat for these. All our bumblebees are generalists. It just depends on their tongue length. Very general rule, most of our early emergers have a shorter tongue length, apart from the common cards and the garden, which have quite long tongue lengths. And most of our late emergers, which are the rarer species, tend to have longer tongues. So you'll probably see, um, if you haven't already, all of these bumblebee species emerging out the queens over the next few weeks. You might even start to see a few workers as well, particularly of the buff tail bumblebee. Um, so they do actually have a winter cycle. So what links these bees together is they are all early emergers, but all of these in the south um, of England will have two colony cycles. 
the bath towel bumblebee is also having a winter cycle as well. And we believe that's due to climate change. So some of those queens are becoming confused. And instead of going into hibernation, they're actually remaining out and trying for a winter cycle. Of course, there's not much forage available. There's a lot of rain during that time. So we're still not sure how successful those winter colonies actually are. So these are our most common bumblebees. And these are the ones that you'll see um, in urban areas. Our rarer threatened species, um, we actually have seven of them. This is showing six of them here. So the short hair bumblebee um, is the one that we attempted to reintroduce. So that is actually an extinct UK species. These other five here um, in the southeast, you will find all of these species in and around mainly coastal areas around the Thames estuary. That's where they've been pushed to. So we do find them, of course, uh, scattered over into the southwest uh, of England, very good areas around coastal areas of Wales, particularly South Wales. And then going up into Scotland, we find the next rare species. So all what do these species have in common? They are later mergers. They can only fit in one colony cycle per year. They tend to have longer tongues, but they rely mostly on open flower rich areas. So that's what we've lost 97% of our ancient flower rich meadows. So it's this group that are the ones that are classed as rare and threatened. The seventh rarest bumblebee is one called the Great Yellow, uh, Bombus disinguendus. And this bee now is only found in the very tops, the highlands, uh, Scotland, around Caithness, Verso, and some of the islands as well. However, 100 years ago, we did have records of this species in the southeast of England. So this species has had a massive range reduction. It is, it is now extinct in Wales, England, majority of Scotland as well. So we have our, these rare species which have all declined significantly, so now have high conservation importance. So as I said, just going over emergence time, early emergers, we tend to say emerge January to March time, and they can fit in more than one colony cycle. And they have not, in the southeast two colony cycles, all of those. The late emergers tend to emerge May to June, but we are even seeing some of our rare species emerging this month. With climate change, things are a little bit um, uneven here, but they tend to have one cycle. And as I said, they rely on the open, mainly flower rich habitats. So what did we want to do at Bumblebee Conservation Trust to try and address this decline and the extinction of one of our UK's species? So back in 2009, we formed the Short Haired Bumblebee Reintroduction Project. And this was formed by Natural England, Bumblebee Conservation Trust, RSPB and Hymetus. So the aim of this project was to attempt to reintroduce this extinct species. Now, this extinct species is also either very threatened or extinct across the rest of Europe, with the exception of Sweden and Estonia. Now, we knew, of course, that the UK has suffered a large loss of flower-rich habitat. So what we need to do is work with farms and landowners to give that advice to them to be able to manage and maintain flower-rich habitats, how to create them, how to manage them, natural regeneration um, as well. So as we're given this advice, we want to know, well, is it actually working? So what we do is we go out and we record the bumblebee's response to these habitats improvements. And we use ad hoc recording through iRecord and our national bumblebee, uh, bumblebee conservation trust recording scheme, which is called Bee Walk. So we got a lot to do uh, during that time. So it was obviously essential that we um, recruited volunteers uh, as well to help us with doing this. We're going out and recording, uh, helping us create habitat as well. And we also did lots of outreach as well to try and spread the word that actually we have had uh, bee species go extinct in the UK. And we really don't want any more to go extinct. And most simply how everybody can help our bees as well. So the short hair bumblebee reintroduction project ran from 2009 to 2021, and we're now working on its legacy project. So where did we start this project? Well, we chose the area that it was last recorded, and it was last recorded in Dungeness in 1988. Pacific surveys went to try out and find this bee, but to no avail. So it's officially declared extinct in the UK in the year 2000. 
Now, this area um, of Dungeness, the South Kent, East Sussex area, is a hot spot as well for other rare species. In fact, we have four other rare species that are found in and around here. So we selected this area. It's the last place the shorthead bumblebee was recorded. But also by creating habitat, working with farmers, different landowners, we could create habitat on a landscape scale that would hopefully also help these other species as well. So what were we doing during that time? Well, the biggest thing that we were working on was land management advice. And this was really the crucial thing. So getting that baseline habitat landscape scale back, connecting up good populations and good areas of flower rich habitats. So the main focus was working with our farmers and encouraging farmers to sign up into agri-environment schemes. So they were, these farmers, if they sign up, will get paid for leaving habitat aside so, for example, if they have a livestock farm, they can reintroduce flower rich meadows, rotate their grazing um, when they take their hay cuts to extend that flowering season. Also, as well, we also advised obviously with arable farmers and they can have pollen and nectar mixes which surround an arable field. And those can be anything from four, even up to 12 metres wide, depending on what the farmer selects. So with our farmers, we were advising on cutting, grazing regimes, stocking density, natural regeneration, how to prepare um, seed sowing, how to prepare the seed bank, which seed mixes are going to be suitable for that soil type as well. Other landowners we work with, so of course farmers were incredibly important, they have a large uh, land mass and many of our rare bees are found on these farmlands. But of course other landowners um, were vital as well, so we worked with Environment Agency on the sea walls, Kent County Council managing the aptly named bee roads, lots of other NGOs as well, parish councils, basically anybody that was willing to work with us, we could give advice um, on how to create habitat. And it doesn't matter what soil type you have, what aspect you have, um, how it's been managed before, there is always something we can do. So again, it's advising on the management of those areas and really trying for a lot of natural regeneration, allowing the seed bank to come through and really using seed sowing more as a last resort, say the area has been very heavily fertilized before. And it wasn't just one off visits when we were working uh, with these landowners. It is a long time collaboration. So it's building up a rapport with these landowners and matching what their land is to what they can do. So many landowners are going to have a variety of different constraints. So it's making sure that what you prescribe is going to be manageable by that landowner and then it will be managed long term and have that sustainability. So the most important thing, of course, is finding out what do the bees actually need? This is what we needed to address for the reintroduction. What do these rare species need? What is actually missing from the landscape? Why they keep declining? So we know, obviously, from the majority of our bee species, if we include our most common ones, they need forage from March to October. The Bath Town now, it has a winter cycle, and I believe that's going up into Midlands, even into the north as well. So we've got to think about that winter forage. So what we've got to do is when we're thinking particularly biasly towards our, our rare bees, is thinking about the abundance, the diversity of flowers that are in that area. So as I said, our bees, bumblebees have sort of two tongue lengths. We crudely put them in two short tongues and long tongues. And the majority of our rarer species are longer tongue bees. So they need flowers with longer corollas. So things like foxgloves, comfrey, in this photo, you've got red clover, uh, meadow vetching, birdsfoot treffle, tufted vetch, ideal open meadow flowers. Well, when we were doing our survey, so whenever we give advice to a farmer, a landowner, we do a survey first. And what we noticed across the landscape scale, particularly for our rare bumblebees, was there was limited amount of forage, April and May, as the queens start to emerge. And then again, end of August going in September. June, July, when is a lot of when our wildflowers are in flower, and that's what a lot of seed mixes are targeting June, July, we actually have a reasonably good abundance. But it's when the queens emerge and right at the end of the colony cycle that there is less habitat. And of course, those are crucial times for allowing the colony to set up those queens, establishing it. Right at the end is when the new queens and males are produced. They need food continuously to that time. So if the food ends, 
beginning of August, mid-August, it may not see the colony through to the end of the cycle. And again, it may die before producing the new queens and males. Now, bumblebees, we say roughly as well, will forage up to about one mile. That's if they have to. Certainly some species will potentially forage a lot further as well. But they will forage up to a mile, but they need that connectivity as well. So they forage closer to their nest if the food is available there. If they have to, they go further. But again, it's in that landscape. And what we do is we work on a one kilometre squared on the short hair bumby project. And we made sure that there was forage available continuously throughout that habitat. We also have to create nesting, hibernation areas as well. So areas of longer grass, um, which will attract rodents in, create holes, um, longer grass board and hibernation areas, north facing banks, slopes, ditches as well. Another big impact that we're seeing, particularly in this area, um, most of my projects are all of my projects are in the southeast and climate change is becoming more and more of an impact here. We're getting a lot of flowers that are set in seed much earlier, sometimes a week, two weeks, even three weeks earlier. Um, so many of them haven't actually been officially pollinated. They might not actually be setting seed properly, but they are also reducing the flowering season. So that's why it's really important now when we're giving habitat advice, is to encourage uh, plants that have long tap roots. Things like brambles, the knapweeds are excellent. Areas around ditches, ponds, water bodies are also good because at least the soil is going to be a little bit damper as well. And much more high, hardier plants. So things like the mallows as well are very, very tough. So it's again actually now adapting our advice to make sure um, there is always something in flower really with climate change as well. Now, this is just an example of a farm visit we did. This was back in 2017, but it just shows quite nicely here the forage that's available. And again, you can see mid um, June, July, the forage there is a lot more abundant. There's more forage available. But early May to mid May and then halfway through August, September, that's when there's really not much forage available. And there is less plants that are available at that time natively as well. But some of the best plants are white dead nettle, ground ivy, yellow flag iris, common vetch, comfrey at that beginning times of the year. Really good, excellent forage. Later as well, things like black whorehound are very good. Water mint. And if you slightly uh, change your, your grazing regime, you can actually have a later flowering field as well. So it's not just taking all the livestock off at the same time. If you take them off at different times, it means it will stagger as well the flowering time. So you can create an early meadow by taking your livestock off early, but also a slightly later one if you leave your livestock on later. And that will mean the red clover, the tufted vetch, the meadow vetching will flower later as well. So it's all these things on a landscape scale, which means you can get hopefully continuation of forest. The most important thing though as well of course is what's already there. You don't want to obviously destroy a habitat that is already very very good for another species so you need to make sure you know what's there and hopefully you can just tweak that to extend the forage season, increase the flower diversity. So whenever we go to an area we do a wildflower inspection survey to see what's there where are the forage gap missing and where are the opportunities there? So natural regeneration, of course, is the most cheapest things to do. The seed bank is going to fit your soil type and it's probably going to be the most hardiest as well. If they do result uh, to seed sowing, the seeds must be suitable for that soil type. There's no point in putting in a chalk mix when you've got clay. The majority of stuff will never come through. And of course, it's got to be native to that area uh, as well. What we also do is do extra planting um, as well to extend the forage season with things like black whorehound, white dead nettle, the species I've mentioned before. So we also do a lot of habitat work on the short hair bumblebee project. So this is again where places like on bee roads or on small holdings, they want to create this habitat, but they might not have the time or the tools to create it. But whenever we're creating habitat, it needs to make sure that the landowner can actually maintain it thereafter. So whatever we advise, um, whatever we do, it's got to be in keeping that landowner and it's got to be in keeping with the constraints that they may have uh, as well. So monitoring, we've created this habitat um, and we created on over 2000 hectares during the uh, sub the short hair bumblebee project stage, 
we want to know what, how is this working because the most important thing is if you're doing this creation you need to know whether it's working so we do monitoring with the bee walk transects which are a monthly uh, transects that are walked from march to october and we also do ad hoc recording and bumblebee blitzes as well every two weeks so we focus these on areas where we've given habitat advice so we can then see okay how's the forage changing over time because we do our wildflower surveys how is that then affecting the bee numbers so we can record changes over time in wildflowers but also in our bumblebees as well so this could give us an idea of how our work is improving our bumblebee numbers so when we do and record our bumblebee numbers um, what we also do is record what forage they're visiting as well. So we're currently analysing um, a lot of our visitation rates. So we can do this per species per month of the year, what they're foraging on. And we can also look at what's available in that area as well. So what are each species of bee, bumblebee actively visiting? What are they choosing? You can then get a preference list for each of those species. And you can look at which species will attract the greatest number of bees as well. So this is a bit of an initial, very quick uh, look at those um, results and the top 20 flowers visited by, this is grouping all bumblebee species together. Red clover is incredibly important, Trifolium pretense. Other things again, like comfrey, bramble is also incredibly important. Again, because it's got tap roots, it will keep producing nectar and pollen. So I know a lot of land managers uh, don't like bramble, but having some there is vital. White dead nettle is also very important. The red dead nettle is very good at this time of year. Viper's bugloss is very good as well. It literally drips nectar, so any tongue length of bee can use it. So that's just some initial results that we've been going through, and we'll be looking into that more as well. So how else? You know, we're doing this under the name of trying to reintroduce one of our extinct bees, but also trying to make sure that our other rare bumblebee species don't go extinct, we don't lose them from this area, and it can be used then as a case study that can be replicated elsewhere across the UK and the rest of Europe. So during those um, first sort of 10, 11 years of the short hair bumblebee project, we had advised on over 2,000 hectares. So that's advising on managing, creating, um, livestock grazing, um, cutting regimes. So we can divide those into four different types of the advice that we give. So before management, if we're just changing the cutting grazing, if we're doing cutting grazing sowing, or if we're doing cutting grazing and planting. So green hay, I should say, goes in with the sowing as well. So let's have a look at the results. So what we found was, which was great, is that all bees do increase as a result of this. And most specifically, our rare bumblebees have increased as a result of this, in particular, the brown banded and the ruderal. So it's interesting, we can then pull that apart for each individual species as well. But it's nice to show over long term that rare bee species will actually increase. Now, you may think, well, you plant more flowers, it's going to work but you've got to prove that on a landscape scale. And this is a true life experiment here. This is true life working with real farmers, working with different landowners, the environment agency to create its habitat on a landscape scale. So we believe it's the first project uh, across Europe that's actually found these positive results from a true life um, actually experiment. And the most important thing was it was long-term. So we had long-term data we're working mainly on closal, and that can take three to five years to actually get a good wildflower meso come through. We also had a significant increase um, during this time and after of the brown band and the rudel, so two of our rarest species. With our moss cardi bee in this area, where we found that we were doing habitat work, the population is sustainable. But if we compare that to other areas in the UK where this bee is found, it's actually declining. So we need to do a lot more research into the moss cardi to find out really what else we can do to help this species. But most importantly, the brown band and rubedal have significantly increased as a result of this work and landscape scale restoration, which is something we're really excited about. We're also looking at populations as well. Um, and this is looking at, these are our monthly bee walks that we've been doing since 2010. Um, it's come up right up to current day. And what this compares is all the species that we find within the, 
the Bee Connected area, which is, sorry, the legacy project of the Shorthead Bumblebee project. So the Shorthead Bumblebee project ran to 2001. We're now in uh, Bee Connected, which has been running since 2022. So that's a legacy project of the Shorthead Bumblebee. So you can see where these bee species are found, um, we have compared our bee walks to. So all the species that we find on these transects are compared to areas where we don't work in. And you can see here that um, that, our, that on our bee walks in the areas we've been creating habitat, we do find greater number of bees that we find. So again, we can show these populations are doing better in these areas where we're doing habitat creation. We've also pulled this apart for each individual species as well. And again, we're pleased to show that um, the moss carder, the brown band and the ruderal, we are recording higher compared to other areas in the country where they're found because we're doing that habitat intervention. So we've obviously increased a lot of recording effort in this area, but we believe because of our interventions, rare species have increased. We also have now find that the Rudal Bumby, this is probably one of the best areas in South Kent and East Sussex for this species. And all five of the rare species that we find in this area have been recording areas not recorded in between five to 25 years. So not only though is it good for those rare species, six of our most common species are also recording to that management uh, interaction as well. The buff tail is stable. Um, we haven't detected any population changes in that one. So, of course, this is restoring an ecosystem that has largely been lost for the UK as well. So this has been very beneficial for those other species as well that rely on these open wildflower habitat. So let's just go through the reintroduction then. <clears throat> so that's been hopefully the successful part of the project. The reintroductions had quite mixed success, unfortunately. So the reintroduction project, as I said, is based around uh, South Kent and East Sussex. The hotspot, the hub of that was the Dungeness area, last recorded in, in 1988. Prior to extinction, it was found all the way up into Humberside and scattered recordings a little bit into Wales um, and going up to the Midlands as well. But the southeast and particularly the coastal areas were the stronghold for this one. Why this species has gone extinct? It's a late emerging long tongue species. It knows open flower rich habitat. This species has climbed across the whole of its European range as well, except for Sweden and Estonia. So this is where we focus the reintroduction on, and that's all the work that we've done with the landowners. So how do you go about reintroducing something that's gone extinct? Well, of course, it's not easy because there's a variety of reasons of why, of course, it might have gone extinct. But in Sweden, the population is actually increasing. And it's actually there in Estonia that the populations are still doing well. And in Sweden, they've actually recolonized um, over the border into Norway. So that's a really positive sign. So we asked the Swedish bumblebee expert Bjorn Sederberg, could we come over to Sweden and collect queens, um, a maximum of 100 queens per year? And he agreed. So we agreed on 100 because that is um, correlates to 0.01% of the short-haired bumblebees population in Sweden. And we went to the very southern province of Sweden, which is called Skuna. And in this area, we had two transects from Trelleborg to Ustad and Lund to Landskrona. So we collected 100 queens maximum during this time. And that's how many we could keep in quarantine as well back in the UK. So we had two distinct transects that were over 35 miles apart to get distinctive genetic variation from them and these both these transects uh, again were a large uh, 30 miles long so again trying to increase the genetic diversity of the ones we collected. Now most importantly when we were collecting these queens between the five years before we started doing it we did collect queens we brought them back in 2011 to disease screen them to see what was present in that population is it similar to the rest of Europe? Is it similar to the UK? Um, and how? What, what was basically the assemblage there? So Professor Mark Brown did this at Royal Holloway, University of London, and he also did our quarantine for us. Now, that was not a legal requirement of the reintroduction. In fact, all we needed to do was test them for honeybee diseases. Uh, and the diseases that we had to test for don't affect bumblebees anyway. 
So what we wanted to do was you shouldn't be moving, obviously, uh, bees around, around the world without disease screening them first. So we put them into two weeks and we were able to do fecal screening on those, Mark did, and any that were diseased, parasite, had nematodes, would die during that time or they were not able to be released. So we collected over these five years about 415 queens and only half of them were released. Now, of all bumblebee queens, we say roughly that 50% are going to emerge from hibernation, but a further 50% of those will actually have diseases and parasites. And that's what we found in this population as well. So when we let them go, we did just let them free fly and they decided where to nest and forage because they knew far better than us where to let them go and, and where they wanted to uh, establish their nest. So we invited along farmers and different landowners to release their own queen as a thank you for the work they'd done. So these were the release days and we saw evidence um, of queens foraging thereafter and some slight evidence of worker establishment. Unfortunately though we haven't had any further sightings since 2016 our last reintroduction. Why not? Well, it could be the small numbers, of course, that, that we released, but that's what we agreed with the Swedish government, and that's how many we could fit in quarantine. One of the biggest things I think why it didn't work was because in quarantine, they were there for two weeks. During that two weeks, normally they'd be looking for a nesting site, establish that, they'd be eating pollen, redevelop their ovaries and laying eggs. We did feed them with pollen and nectar, of course, during this time, but we didn't want to feed them with too much that they would start to lay eggs within quarantine, because if they lay eggs in one place, they will not then found another nest. They will be loyal to that nest. So we fed them with enough to keep them going, but not enough to lay their eggs because we didn't want them to, to nest during quarantine. So we let them go, but they were obviously, of course, slightly two weeks behind. So we wanted to keep them in quarantine. We needed to make sure they were disease free, but that could have impacted then how they established nests, um, what nesting was then available when we released them as well, because it was obviously later in the season. We will always, though, continue to look for our short haired bumblebee. And you never know, I'm always hopeful that maybe it might be out there somewhere. It's not a particularly easy bee, um, bumblebee to ID, but you never know. But the most exciting thing really was that we got these other rare bees. So what we wanted to do and what we've been doing uh, for the last couple of years is the legacy project of the Short Hair Bumblebee project, which is called Bee Connected. So just to punish ourselves, we increased our area by over 100% and we took all of the positives from the Short Hair Bumblebee. So working with farmers, working with community groups, recruiting volunteers, doing bee walks, going out and doing surveys and did this over a bigger scale to connect up more populations of rare bees. So we are not doing any more reintroductions. We don't want to take um, these queens from an area and potentially be depleting that, that host area. We know Sweden has a good bumblebee population, but it wouldn't be right for us to keep reintroducing them if we didn't know why they weren't successful here or until we've actually found a good population. So how's it going? Well, we're really pleased. So we currently work with 68 farmers and that's permanent and with 90 landowners. And we've advised along with the Short Hair Bumby project and over 3,500 hectares. We have over 100 bee walks and we have eight wildflower case study sites as well. So it's been really successful in bringing together farmers, landowners, creating habitat across that landscape scale. We also do do lots of outreach as well, and that on average is about to 3,000 people a year. So again, raising the profile of our bumblebees, using them as a flagship for not only insect pollinator increase, but also restoration of this habitat. As of 2024, we have over 92 active volunteers and they help with bumblebee and wildflower surveys, habitat creation. Some of them even do data entry, so they are worth their weight in gold uh, as well. So that's our project, the legacy of the Short Hair Project. But as I said, we've also got a new project that's going on in the East End of London. Um, and this is called Buzzing in the East End, B for short. So you may think of London and think, well, that's a heavily urbanised area. There's not going to be very many rare bumblebees there. Actually, though, historically, we have recorded four rare 
bumblebee species. And we still know the brown banded and shrill are present in some of these areas. And I'm hoping the rude or red shank we might find as well, and maybe even the moss carder. So we don't have that many recent records. So what we really want to do is find out where they are. And of course, they're increasingly under threat from again, urbanization, climate change, habitat fragmentation. So we're working across these 11 boroughs, and this is a 12 month development phase we're doing at the moment. And we're looking to see where the rare bumblebees are. And once we find these rare bumblebees, what we can then do is hopefully work with the local communities to create habitat for them. So this is the distribution of rare bumblebees. We know there are a few more records there as well, but it's just trying to find out where they are, what habitat they're in, how can we help them? So this is a 12 month development phase funded by Consumer Bumblebee Conservation Trust. So this first 12 months is looking at well, where are they? Where do they still remain? What's the habitat like? Is the habitat good where they are or do we need to do more? And those will be really the hot spots that we take forward. And once we take forward these hot spots into our delivery phase, we really want to work with as diverse range of communities, underrepresented communities as possible to get everybody engaged and hopefully um, creating habitat, which is good for local people, good for their mental health, Great to have the, their on your local doorstep habitat for people, but for bees as well. So at the end of these 12 months, we're hoping to then do a four to five year delivery stage as well. So we're looking for current partners and then we will have project officers north and south of the river as well. So if you're more interested um, in this project, you can sign up to our monthly newsletter. I've got Scarlett's email address there. Um, and you can also find out more information about the Bee Connected project, the Short Hair Bumby project, and Bee um, on our web pages as well. And we have so many fantastic projects at Bumby Conservation Trust as well in the Southwest, um, across Wales, uh, into Scotland, in the Midlands as well. So please do have a look at our web page because there's lots and lots of information about what we're doing. So very quickly before I end, how you can get involved as well is through our National Bee Walk Scheme. So this is a national recording scheme of one to two kilometers. You walk it each month between March to October and you have a look at the bumblebees and you say which cast they are, is it a queen work or a male and what plants they're foraging on. It's a national recording scheme. So it means that we can detect population changes over time which are the winners, which are the losers. So it can give us early signs of losses, but also which species might be doing well. If you didn't have enough time to do a bee walk, I do highly recommend go using iRecord, which means you can put in all your ad hoc recordings. Of course, iRecord covers every single species from birds um, to mosses, lichens, and you can record your bumblebees on there as well. So the more records we have, the more we can do to help them. And just quickly before I finish as well, um, if anybody would like to become a member of Bumblebee Conservation Trust, uh, please do. It's only £25 a year, so it's an absolute uh, bargain as well. But that is it from me. So thank you so much, everybody, um, for listening. Uh, you can get in contact with me there. And we also have um, a presence on the social media, which is Buzzing in the South East. And that covers Bee Connected, the Bee Project uh, as well. So you can hear all about what we're doing, where we're going to be doing events. Uh, we might be doing blitzes near you if you're in London. We'll be doing blitzes in Kent and East Sussex. So please do come along and join us uh, if you're free. OK, so thank you very much uh, for all listening and, and back to back to Kieran.